Well, and here we go again. What's this, the fifth week, Rory? Oh, I lost count. You know, it's too many of these. <laughs> you do enough day drinking, the days just kind of roll on by, you know? <laughs> well, hi, everyone. I'm John Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog's Leap. And I'm Rory Williams, owner and winemaker of Frog's Leap Winery. And, Dad, we got a, a pretty cool session. Uh, yeah, we've uh, set up, we have a little different setting here today. What, what do you mean? <laughs> you didn't notice? Oh, my God, where are we? <laughs> out in the bushes out here in the bushes we're actually out here in our office block cabernet here at the winery what we call red barn office block and uh we're sitting here in the middle of some cover crop uh getting ready to, to drink drink some wine with you guys so you know we got get a change of scenery here uh obviously we got a little bit of a different setup it's like a jack and the beanstalk here i know yeah. it's climbing up <laughs> dad i will say one thing that hasn't changed you know what it is what's that Oh, we need, hey, we need some wine. need some wine. Get the first wine in your glass. <laughs> we want you guys to start drinking too, okay? Mostly because we want to start yeah, drinking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> parched up here. Okay, first polling question of the day is how many people had wine for lunch? Yay! <laughs> how many people had wine for breakfast? <laughs> no, 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 no. I've slowed down a little oh, okay. bit. Okay, <laughs> slowed down. Uh, well, I can't tell you how excited I am for uh, this session today, you guys. Uh, first of all, to be drinking a wine literally a foot away from uh, one of the 986 vines that produced this wine uh, right here in the middle of the block that so many of you uh, have uh, been in yourself because uh, literally our tasting uh, deck is just a few feet that way and so many of you trod in this vineyard and I think there's something special about drinking a wine while you're sitting in the vineyard where it comes from. It is very cool. So make sure you guys have the uh, the 2015 Office Block Cabernet in your glass because it's uh, the vines are right here. We're surrounded by them. It's pretty, pretty cool. Well, and I'm doubly excited. Now, do we have any technical uh, stuff we have to deal with? Today? Yeah, we probably do. Yeah, well, we we that, you know, that's your job. These things. <laughs> so um, you can find info about these wines and all the past wines and the future wines on interactive.frogsleep.com. It includes some uh, videos of, uh, of your lovely hosts here uh, going back for the last few sessions. Um, ask questions in the Q&A. Um, our professional production team will be monitoring the Q&A and they'll be feeding some of those questions to us. We kind of hope to uh, address some of the questions maybe that you guys have about organic farming, about dry farming, about any kind of the topics that we touch on today. Um, and we're gonna try and get to cover as much ground as we as we can. Well, I can't tell you how excited I am. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this session about uh, organic farming really almost since we uh, started doing these uh, tastings with you just because uh, I, I can't even begin to how, express how passionate I am about this subject. And I'm gonna to apologize uh, to you all in advance and uh, Rory, I, I charge you with, you know, I can get a little carried away on uh, <laughs> some of this. So keep me on track We, here. we have a bucket of water right yeah, here. Yeah, just yeah, in case yeah, dump it on get me, yeah. get me slowed down. <laughs> but uh, you know, anyone who knows uh, anything about frog sleep knows that we have been uh, farming organically for uh, over 30 years and uh, and uh, that's a long time when you think about the really the track of uh, of organic farming uh, here in California, really in our in our country. Uh, and so we were very early adopters of that, and we're really uh, it's evolved almost into an ethos for Frog's Leap that goes way beyond the principles that are ascribed it in the formal definition of what organic farming is. I, I think it's beyond that for us. I think it really is, Dad. I mean, it's. Uh, I think often when we uh, we get people who are new to organic farming or new to the fact that we farm organically, uh, there's sometimes a, there are preconceptions about organics out there. There always are about any kind of uh, hot button issues like that. And I often, you know, sometimes organics is in my mind misperceived as just this kind of negative thing where you you know you don't spray what this. can't you do yeah, yeah what can't you do what what chemicals can't you spray in your vineyard really what we're hoping to do today is talk to you guys about what we do for me organic farming is is a set of actions it's a set of uh, uh, of actions that you do in the vineyard that are guided by a farming philosophy and our whole goal here at frog sleep is to try to understand the soil understand the vine and figure out how can we how can we augment and how can we work with the vine and with that soil, building soil health, building the riches and soil, so that we create a vine that's naturally helps us in a fight against fights against disease and helps get us to the point where we want with wine quality. All of these uh, this principle and and these sets of actions are a positive force in our lives, and that's always how we've thought about it. Is it's uh, you know we we get to the point where we just don't need to spray these. Well, you, you say it's how we always thought about it, but certainly not how I 
thought about it when I first got started 30 years ago. How did ago. you get started with it anyway? How did you, this well, guy you know, showed up with a tie-dye t-shirt. No, 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 it's not exactly no, it's that. A, it, almost exactly the opposite, you know, when I mm -hmm. came off the farm to Cornell to ag school in the, in the early 70s, very early 70s, you know, I was, uh, it, everything was about uh, the scientific method uh, uh, applied to agriculture, the so-called green revolution, how we could uh, input-based agriculture, how we could add nitrogen and other chemicals to the farming system and increase the yields by 10%. Everyone was, uh, you know, we were going to solve all the problem, food problems in the world by input-based agriculture, by bringing fertilizers and, and so on into the soil to make it productive beyond its, its uh, uh, beyond reason. And uh, this was so exciting, and, and, and this is what I got caught up when I, when I started studying agriculture in, in the early 70s. But even then, we were starting, starting to understand that there were problems with this model. All of a sudden, we needed herbicides, and we, needed, we found out that just nitrogen didn't do it. We needed other chemicals, and, and, and so the cracks in the wall were starting to show up, even as I was uh, a, a young student in all this. At the same time, we were hearing about some of the you know, I read uh, Rachel Carlson, uh, Silent Spring, and if you've never read that, you know, it's, it's about the first understanding of how, how these pesticides and so on can have a, a, a negative impact. And, and so we were starting to question farming in general. Now, organic farming wasn't thought to be an alternative at that point. The principles of organic farming were laid down by Sir Albert Howard in 1940 in an agricultural testament, his seminal work. Uh, but really it wasn't until uh, his later book, Soil and Health, that it became popular at all because of the Rodale Institute in this country. But still, organic farming was the provenance of back to the landers and, and health enthusiasts and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, hippie, the hippie movement very, very much associated with organic farming and, and healthy living advocates. And that's where it was confined to, was not thought to be part of uh, of uh, mainstream agriculture in any sense of the world, which is probably what drew me to it. Uh, <laughs> a, little, a little contrarian as ever. Yeah, yeah but uh, you know, so it was this combination of questioning uh, input-based agriculture at the same time we were growing evidence of, of, of what was available in the organic uh, uh, sector, and it got me excited. And I think that's what's from what's been interesting for me, Dad, is having you describe. Uh, you know, you you mentioned Sir Albert Howard and the the. Uh, sort of the, uh, the beginning of regenerative agriculture, or regenerative farming in a, in a way, that, in the concept of that entering into, into agriculture as this kind of positive thing that you can do. You don't have to just let things go and, and, no. and, and yeah. kind of hope and pray that something's going to go right. Instead, it's, it's a matter of working with the soil and trying to build soil health and build richness in the soil. If, if, if there's one thing we want to have you walk away with today is to understand that organic farming isn't about not using chemicals. It really is fundamentally about building your soil health. And we're sitting amongst the solution to that right now. These flowers behind us, these plants behind us, are not planted for uh, landscaping. These are literally the food for the soil. And we turn this organic matter back into the soil, and this is the food for the soil. And what we know is that healthy living soil produces a healthy living plant, and a healthy living plant, like a healthy person, will naturally re resist disease. And so organic farming is really about this idea of returning life and health back into the farm, primarily through the soil. And I, th I think a key tenet of this, and the one that really helps, you know, not to leap too far ahead, because we'll talk about this more, you know, as we go along, but, you know, often the question is like, okay, well, you know, how does that affect wine quality, or how does it does it make the wine better? And I think it's more about um, you know proper organic farming when you're working with the soil that you're in. What you're you're really conceiving of and, and, and thinking about the soil in each individual spot. Where it's it's actually extra fun tasting these single block wines that we're tasting today because when we uh, here at Frog Sleep, you know, we farm organically. We farm all 200 of our acres organically, but every single one of those acres and really every single little corner of those acres is thought about differently and has its own individual kind of personality in a way where we're sitting here in office block cavernous so kind of top so top one down. size doesn't fit all one size it. definitely doesn't fit all and i think that that's extremely important for wine quality because the the uh the sort of input based mentality that you Speaking might have of wine with, quality by yeah, the way yeah, yeah. Would you, yeah that's pretty good there. <laughs> 
<laughs> pour, pour a little more in there. Help yourself, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> the idea of you know the, the standpoint of a kind of input-based form of viticulture and and how we farm things is me coming into this block and saying I know what these grapes want and I know what the the wine out of here should taste like. It should taste like 100 points, right? It should taste like uh, this mm. set of standards that everybody loves. So an imposed what, idea of what, what that wine. You're coming be. in there and you're you're desiring to control nature. You're desiring to come in and, and kind of impose our will upon this, and that requires a lot of work. You know, sometimes the stars align and it just kind of happens, but more often than not, you're talking about fertilizer, herbicides, excessive synthetic pesticides. You're talking about irrigation water. Um, you're talking about a, a system of tools that we have as as humans that we've developed over time to impose our will on the soil. Now, okay, that'll get you grapes. It will get you grapes and sight trumps all in, in winemaking. You know, it, you can't just... Words we don't use. Yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, we're not going down that path. Okay. It's, uh, but re true farming, a true, truly high quality... Uh, you know, I'm the one that's supposed to be getting excited about this. Look at I, you, I, man. I, I, I get off with... <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> What, we, what really excites us about making wine is working with every single plant and working within every single soil type. That means that we need to go out there and understand this soil. Gravel, the gravel that exists in office block is different than where some of you may have the, the Merlot 110R in your glass, uh, in well, maybe in another glass, uh, in another bottle. When we taste that, that's a different soil type, a different variety that requires a different kind of uh, mentality different standpoint, a different set of practices, a slightly different set of practices with that soil than we practice with office block. And that's the whole point. The diversity is the point. And I think that if you if we really had to kind of sum up the, the actions of organic farming, it's to promote diversity. It's diversity up top in terms of having all of this, this beautiful green, greenery around us, having biodiversity in our farming system. We grow 40 other crops besides grapes, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, we got peaches. Uh, we're, you know, we peaches, pears, figs, apples, cherries, nectarines, pomegranates, citrus, olives, uh, what am I forgetting? You know? Say it backwards now. I can't. <laughs> we have all of this diversity that we cultivate up top, and but I, th I think almost more importantly is the part that's invisible, um, and that is the, the soil diversity, the diversity of microbes in the soil that are challenged to exist in a, a top-down, input-based, lots of herbicides, lots of synthetic inputs kind of situ situation. Organic farming at its core, and, and it should be worth mentioning that you won't find this definition of organic farming on the USDA organic website. Well, and you need to keep in mind, Rory, that we started farming organically before there was a formal definition. It really was a, a an ad hoc group of, of farmers who were laying down the rolls. The first really set down of rules was the Organic uh, Food Act of 1990, which, which really came out of the hippie farmer generation. But the USAA didn't set down their standards till much later. And in, in, in our mind, those standards have been watered down to the point where it's it, it, it doesn't really capture the philosophy that we're talking about. And in and, and about, you know, it, so it's almost possible to be an organic farmer without, and meet the technical rules, without understanding the philosophy and the deepness for, with which we apply it. And I think that's cr critical to understand. Yeah, and I, 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 we're gonna talk today, and, and, and I think that's enough said about the USDA organic uh, program. I think it's, what's to us is more interesting is talking about what we believe in as organic farmers, what we truly believe is organic farming, both in the spirit and in the letter. And, you know, we hope to kind of take you through some of that. So, where should we start? Where do you start <laughs> with organic farming anyway? Well, the way we started, the way I started was I got interested in this and I heard about a couple other uh, people in California who are starting to farm grapes organically. Paul Dolan up at Fetzer Vineyards, the phrase, the Katuris over in uh, Sonoma and Mendocino County in it. And I was, it, it struck me at the same time that my, my, my cracks were, were showing in my, my understanding of agriculture, now being a student at UC Davis. Also about the same time that we acquired the first vineyard, the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where Trace of Boris is now, and, and, um, and having to actually farm and, and make those decisions. Most of you knew I, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on my grandfather's dairy farm. And, and he was really a farmer before the modern input-based agriculture, and that's so that was my exposure. 
and then this learning. So I was starting to question all this about the time that I heard a few people were doing it. What I later came to realize that there were other people in Napa who were interested in doing this, and I, yeah, I give them some credit for that, but it was really underground at that point. But I decided to call a few growers together who were growing grapes for us, and, and uh, it, enough credit cannot go to Frank Leeds, who, who really is, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about organic farming all day long about the principles of it. At a certain point, it needs to be put down into practice. At a point, you actually do need to, do need to farm, yeah. right? And, and so Frank was immediately acceptable of this. He, uh, and and, and uh, so we had a group of nine growers uh, meet, and as far as I know, it's the first time in the Napa Valley that there was ever a meeting with the specific purpose of understanding principles of organic farming, and, and we didn't know anything about it, so we had called up to Fetzer asking him if he wanted to go up there and check it out, and they said, we don't know what we're doing, we got this guy Amigo Bob that tells us what to do, and so I'd invited Amigo Bob uh, down to address us, we had no idea what to expect, um, but Amigo Bob is, you know, we talk, a self-described hippie. He is one of those people that kept this tradition of organic farming alive. And when he came in, and he was in full regalia, by the way, uh, he came in and we did not know what to think, literally, because there's so many misconceptions. That this is 1988 uh, about what organic farming was that I literally had to bolt the door to keep the other farmers in the room. <laughs> You're not leaving. Because we were thinking about, well, we're going to lose crop, and we're going to lose quality, and we're going to have disease, and and so on and so forth, and we're going to have to do this, and our vineyards are going to look ratty, and so on and so forth. But that's not what he talked about at all. He talked about what we're talking about, this idea of building fundamental health in your soil, bringing it alive, returning health and life back into the system. Sir Alan Howard's work was all about the law of return, about if you take from a field, or a, by, by virtue of taking its crop, you have to give back in equal measure. And it's this law of return of fertility cycling that was really the principles of it. So we went on and talked about, not about not using chemicals, but about not needing chemicals, about, about bringing your, your vineyard, your soil alive. And it resonated with all of us to a certain degree and really launched what I would call the organic movement in the Napa Valley. At that point, there were no certified farms. We certified the first two in 1988. Uh, and uh, now there are more certified acreage in Napa County, Grape Acreage, than any other county in in, uh, in California. And I'm really proud of that, to say the least. It is very cool. I think it's, uh, it's a philosophy that naturally ties in with wine quality, which is maybe why you saw it really, really flourish here. I mean, I, I think that some people may be asking, you know, what, what, what do you mean return life into the soil? I mean, it sounds it's pretty easy to kind of go with a couple of platitudes with this. But I think what's pretty cool about where we're sitting right now is you're looking at it. You're looking at life that's growing above ground, but importantly, I think, should we do a little show and tell? I think we should, because honestly, uh, you know, uh, this, this is so exciting. Uh, so these cover crops are specifically planted by Frank and Rory to return nutrients back into the soil. And the exciting part of it, and Rory's going to take this up to the camera because okay. this, by the way, you guys, this is a bell bean, correct? There's a bell bean. And so you can see this is what's growing up uh, around our heads right now. This is what's growing up top. You got some oats here growing along the side. But I want to bring this up to the camera and hopefully everybody can see this because the real magic of what goes on here happens right around the roots of this. So as I break this apart, you can see some of the gravel, the characteristic gravel of this, of this block. But if you look on this root, oh, look at those little babies, yeah. You see these nodules on here that almost look pink. Um, these are basically where the magic is happening. So, so it's in the air all around us, 70% of our of the of the uh, air that we breathe is nitrogen. Nitrogen is what plants need, right? Unfortunately, the nitrogen in the air is not available to. Uh, to yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. The nitrogen in the air is not available to plants to use. It's in, a, it's in a form that they can't just grab out of the air and use. But what's really very cool about all these legumes in general, is so these bell beans are one form of it. We also have uh, vetch flowers, the roots of vetch do the same thing, and some of the peas, which have started to recede uh, at this point. On this root, growing in this soil, are these little, uh, these little pink nodules that I just showed you on camera. So those, often you'll hear them described, oh, there's the nitrogen. That's not pointing at the nitrogen. What these are are communities of bacteria growing symbiotically on the roots of these bell beans. 
and basically the plant is providing them a home on its roots and these bacteria have a unique property of being able to take nitrogen out of the air and convert it into a form into a form called ammonium which is the form of nitrogen that plants can use can bring up and start building proteins start growing they need that just like we need a little bit of nitrogen as well to form proteins and this is how they grow now life would not exist without this process exactly so what's happening here is that these little communities are growing underground in the soil and they're t constantly taking nitrogen out of the air putting it into a form that plants can use and actually extruding it right just releasing it from these into the soil right around the roots and the bell beans going sweet that's what i like and what's really happening is that nitrogen is more nitrogen is being put out than the one plant can use so instead that nitrogen is being finding its way into little cracks into the soil between uh, bits of gravel and bits of sand and bits of clay and fixing itself into that soil and becoming a semi-permanent part of the soil. Well, that's nitrogen that plants can use, that any plant can use, including grapevines. So when we, when we say, hey, well, you know, we don't want to add a bunch of nitrogen fertilizer to the ground, which we don't do here at, at Frog Sleep, it's not because we don't care about, you know, we just kind of letting them go without any nutrition in the soil. It's that we're allowing this microbial community to build that nitrogen presence in the soil for us. And that's an example of having a way for nature to work with the farmer. And the, the, the input-based farmer would say, well, what's the big deal here? Just go get a bag of nitrogen, which they can extract now through a chemical process, refine, and add that directly. And this was the promise of the Green Revolution. But what we found out that that doesn't work because that nitrogen has to be in balance with all the other nutrients that the plant needs. And the only way they can get that is by digesting all of this. Now for digestion, digestion, you need microbes. And that's part of the reason why we use compost as well. Did you bring some compost? I did bring a little bit of compost. This is a, you know, everyone wants to know what we do with our leftover grape skins. Which well, here's, cool. here's what it is. Oh, I'm so excited, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, get the good tasting here. So I'll bring this up close because this is really where a lot of the magic of farming can go. So yeah, I mean, Dad, we do get the question all the time. And actually, if you look very close, you can see little grape seeds still in there. Because you're right, Dad, we, what do we do when, so let's, let's go back to basics here. How do you make wine? You harvest grapes and you crush them and then you have a bunch of skins left over at the very end. Well, you know, we do get the question all the time. Well, what do you do with the grape skins at the very end? We make compost out of them. And so if any of you have been here in the spring or summer months, as you drive down the, as soon as we reopen again, we promise you we open as soon as we can. <laughs> drive down the driveway as you're coming into our winery and look to your right and behind some peach trees, you'll see what looks like a big black tarped mound. That's our compost pile. Every single year, we turn all of our grape skins, all of our grape stems that have been chopped up, all of our garden trimmings, anything that we produce. Along with manure. Along with a little manure uh, <laughs> that we buy from our friends out on the coast. Um, if my grandfather, I grew up on a dairy farm, if my, my grandfather knew I was buying cow shit, he would turn over in his grave. I have <laughs> to say, he spent true. his whole life trying to get rid of manure. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Man, we could, we could have gone into business with him. Uh, right? yeah, we, yeah, it would have been great. <laughs> but it's this, you know, this idea of instead of taking these grape skins and sending them off to the dump and then they're, they're, on, they're, off our, uh, they're off the property, they're out of our minds. The idea is take those, build them back into a form that we can really use, that we spread out into the fields every fall. And that's part of what we've built, that, that compost, which maybe we should explain a little bit, Dad. How did, how did, how did, how, when's, when's the first time you heard about compost and what was your thought about that? Well, I mean, it was, it was part of the first lecture we had, but you know, the, no one was making compost at that time. No one understood its value because we thought about, we thought about everything conventionally, that it was fertilizer. And we, when, even when I first started understanding what compost was, I thought of it as fertilizer. That's not what it is at all. It's essentially a, a biological inoculant. That, that little handful of the compost you had is so full of microorganisms that then gets returned with this organic matter and it is that digestion process that breaks those nutrients available and makes them uh, uh, much like our own digestion system and and that's the process not only getting the food for the soil back into the soil but having this deep biological complex 
that breaks it down and makes those nutrients available to the plant. That's the key. So that, you know, it's a, it's a fair question, I think, and as a challenge to organics and, and, you know, why have the biological complexity out there? Can't you just put the nitrogen out there, put your phosphorus out there, put your potassium out there and, and you know, and then you got your irrigation lines, right? So you can just put your water out there. And isn't that all grapes really need to grow? I mean, it's, it's a... Uh, That's what we thought. That's what we thought. And it failed. Yeah. And it is failing. And, 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 the, and the analogy I use, if, I, if you allow me this, is, is a lot to do with like our own health if we think about it, yeah. right? We know that the basis of good health is a balanced diet, some exercise, not burning the candle on all three ends, right? A belt, basic healthy living lifestyle. Three ends of a candle? Well, they're we got, we got, we're gaining ends of the well, candle here. Tori's got these candles at home. Got oh, three my ends. God, crazy candle. <laughs> but the whole idea is is building fundamental health by the way you eat and take care of your body. And it's really what we're talking about with organic agriculture, a healthy diet, a healthy lifestyle. Uh, and, and this is so important. Developing organic matter in the soil to hold moisture. A healthy pound of soil will hold nine pounds of water. This is so critical when we talk about dry farming. Dry farming and organic farming go absolutely side by side. We're gonna tie this together a little bit in the end. But you know, so the whole point of organic farming is much like living a healthy lifestyle as a human. It, it is to build our immune system, it's to build our fundamental health. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't get sick and organic vineyards can have uh, problems just like any other vineyard. But what we know about human health is that if there's sickness about, your best defense is to be the healthiest person in the room. And we want to have the healthiest vines in the Napa Valley because sickness, when it comes, is, is going to devastate someone who has a weak immune system or a shallow root system or, or a, 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 an unbalanced diet. And so, and so then what happens in, in, in a vineyard or in our own lives, what happens when we have a, 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 an unhealthy body and sickness comes around? Well, then we're dependent on antibiotics and, and steroids and all the things that we see on TV to, to promote health or to cure the problem of sickness. But then we also see the ads about all the health effects of those. And it's really the side effects of, of input-based agriculture is, is what becomes apparent, just like the mom, modern pharmaceutical paradigm that we have in our own personal health. And so I like to use that analogy that we're uh, building the immune system, we're building this beautiful, healthy vine, fully nourished, um, with a deep immune system, deeply in connection with all of the, all the other living organisms that uh, that builds health. So, to me, organic farming isn't about not using chemicals. It's about not needing chemicals. It's about it's about building this health from the from the ground up. I think it's right, and I think you know it's an important concept. You know, I'm I'm out there in the field with Frank and with the vineyard crew uh, every day, and putting these kinds of principles into practice. And we've been doing this for uh, for a long time it really is more about prevention and it's about setting up a situation, be, uh, creating an environment, creating a, a, a vineyard that doesn't need added water. It doesn't need added nitrogen fertilizer. Why? Because we've planted cover crops in the fall that grew up high over the winter. We tilled them back into the soil and they slowly and in a managed, in a managed way given nitrogen into that soil for the vines to use for the whole year. And I think that that's a, that kind of slow, gradual, natural kind of uh, fertilization of the soil and accepting of the rain that we get over the winter here is really what sets these vines up for success for the rest of the year. And it's the kind of, if, if you know, we love to have the straw man of, of conventional and farming that we, can, that, that we can talk to in front of here, but it's the difference between walking up to your vine in uh, April or May, right as the vines are starting to grow out and they're saying, oh boy, these don't look so good. They you know, man, might need some nitrogen. Go out there, give them some nitrogen. Going out there in the middle of July and seeing the, the, all the leaves kind of drooping down, like, oh boy, these things might need some water. Go and put some water on them. That's a reaction to yeah. a failing of this vineyard. The, these vines Ha, Much are, like taking medicine. Or, they, or, they, they are looking for these, they need water, they need nitrogen. It's not to say that an organic vineyard doesn't need water and nitrogen. It absolutely does, just like any other living plant. But what we've done or what we try to do, what we strive to do as organic farmers is plant these cover crops in the winter and get them into the soil at the right time 
to be able to slowly deliver and really allow the vines to find their own nitrogen and creating the, creating the kind of soil where these vines can easily go and find their own nitrogen. Not just be force-fed nitrogen through a drip tube, but instead go out and find these nodules, find the nitrogen that's hiding in the cracks of the soil. Aside, part of that is that in order to do that, the vines have to work there. The so vines don't allow, aren't allowed to just kind of sit there and accept fertilizer and right. water out it's of a hose. It's not spoon-fed to them. They have to, they have to digest it. They have to work. They have to develop the root system. They have to work for those nutrients. They absolutely do. And, and I think it's it's important to realize that even that thought process, the the sort of well, you know, we'll just give them, we'll we'll give some cover crops and we'll and we'll uh, you know we'll get some winter rain and the vines will go find it. That's not a cookie cutter approach either. That kind of the specific decisions about timing, when do we when do we put these cover crops into the into the soil? When do we decide to mow? When do we decide, you know, to uh, to add the compost? When, you know, well, what so kind of how do you even decide what what uh, plants to, to to put into your cover crop? Because you can get too much nitrogen in our soil, yeah, right? If you can. if you put it if you had a fertile soil with lots of nitrogen and you kept adding legumes, you could get too much nitrogen over a period of time, correct? It's definitely true. I mean, some fo some soils naturally have higher amounts of nitrogen. Some of them are more fertile than other soils because of having more nitrogen or having a deeper soil. And so you're going to, and we do, change up our cover crop, uh, the specific mix of cover crops that we use in any kind of soil type based on how fertile that soil is. Is there more clay here? Is there more sand? Is there more gravel? All these kinds of differences. And really our best barometers, our best, you know, I like to say we're in this two acre block. We've got about a thousand sensors out here that are telling us how is this, how is this field growing? How are we reacting within this field? And we pay attention to that. And there are, there are ways of paying attention to that that are simply visual, where you're going out there checking the color of the leaves, uh, you're going out and checking the shoot tips, how far they grew, how many canes were able to leave during pruning. Um, and then there are more technical ones. We will go through and take the uh, petioles, which a petiole is essentially the gap, the leaf stem, the leaf stem on here. And so we'll go through and take very specific leaf stems from throughout the entire vineyard, send them to a lab and they will they'll actually uh, uh, carbonize these and analyze them for their mineral content and that will give us a number that we can uh, that we can you know use for context basically on how much nitrogen is in that soil and how much uh, potassium and all that stuff and that's really helps us gu helps guide our decisions going forward about making small decisions ahead of time so if we see from this petiole analysis and you know that hey this this block had lots of nitrogen in it and we go out there and and we realize oh, yeah you know these these leaves are super dark green and the shoots are way up there and there are lots of laterals this block is a little too a little too vigorous it might have a little bit too much nitrogen we'll actually back off on the kinds of legumes like bell beans that add nitrogen to the soil and we'll be talking more about things like daikon radish and triticale wheat which do different things within that soil which really are or more even grasses that can actually take nitrogen out of the soil and not replenish the they'll add minerals back but they'll, they'll yeah. deplete the nitrogen and somewhere. it's it's this process of it but the, the important thing about that i mean you can think about specifics for different soils the important thing is we're thinking about next year's crop an entire year ahead of time so we're planning the kind of natural fertilizer the green manure if you will that we're tilling into that soil is planned more than a year ahead of time and that is i think essential to understanding what the true practice of organic actually involves is it's not about going out there and going, oh, crap we got mildew on our minds it's about knowing that mildew is going to appear you know you've walked your vineyard the whole time so you know more or less where mildew is going to show up every year and so that's the first block that you leave that you open up to the air and allow airflow to come through the canopy um, rather than just kind of saying well you know if it shows up we'll just nuke it with some chemicals which is i have to give a shout out by the way because none of this you can learn from going to the ag extension your ag extension agent or to uc davis right this was this was not knowledge that was had we have had to understand this knowledge from the very beginning and and sure amigo bob was fundamental but i really have to give a shout out to uh, frank leeds who was my vineyard guru at the time and roy's mentor because we really didn't know how to do this and and we started going to ecological the ecological farming conference where where farmers would come and share ideas because this 
information wasn't available anywhere else. And in a, in a way, that sharing of ideas is almost like the sharing of information that plants have when they live in, a, in an ecosystem, a healthy ecosystem. So it's, it's really pretty pretty cool when you yeah, think about it. It is very cool. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, all of that ties into, you know, we talk about these kinds of annual decisions and, if, you know, it's easy to tie into things and we talked about it meshing very easily with dry farming. You know, the vines have to interact with their soil that they're in. We make the, the basic decisions of where to, where and when and what kind of rootstock to use, uh, what kind of variety to plant up top are critical decisions that we make in the vineyard that, you know, even though they're not, you'll never find those kinds of decisions in a list of what you need to do to become certified organic, but they are absolutely essential to understanding what organic farming is. If we were to take the wrong kind of rootstock and put it into this very gravelly, we're here in office block right now, this is a very gravelly soil, it's near to a creek that's coming out of the eastern hills of Napa, it's got large gravel deposits, it's a very well-drained soil. It's not a very vigorous soil, which is why you see all these legumes around us. Um, You're trying to build this soil. We're trying to build uh, build nutritive capacity into the soil over time, and you know we also plant in this uh, uh, plant in this block. The rootstock we use is called 110R, and you'll see that on the Merlot as well. Uh, the, if you, if you have that that bottle with you. 110R is a very drought resistant rootstock. It's a very vigorous. So, rootstock. what you're talking about is con combining conventional knowledge about proper farming with the organic approach to really come up with the result that, that we want. I, I Not feel, to head you off at the past. No, but I, I feel like I feel like they're symbiotic in that in that way, where the proper thinking about how how to match variety rootstock to a particular site and a particular type of soil. You know, that's just part of good farming. I want to taste this Merlot, by the way. I'm going to uh, water this soil. It's, here. it's part of good farming, but I would say that it's absolutely essential to a true understanding of organic farming. Are we going to move on to Merlot? I am. Yeah. I hope you all are, too. Now, I know not all of you were able to get the Merlot. We kind of ran out, but, uh, uh, you know, just grab another Frog's Leaf wine. Uh, don't grab anyone else's wine, though. We don't want to be yeah, you got, if you, what, what are you doing if you got somebody else's wine? That's you know, really get, bogus. Get out of yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, that's really bogus. You're, you are like the person who's going around the museum and you're following the docent around, but you haven't paid for the guy yeah, to yeah, tour. Yeah, you know, listen you're trying to listen in. <laughs> oh, this is nice. So it's worth talking a little bit about, um, you know, when we talked about the office block, that's 2015 vintage. This is the Merlot 110R from the 2014 vintage. These are both uh, drought vintages, 2014 and 2015. We have very low rainfall. Um, I think that it's, you know, these are both what we call fellowship selections. So the Fellowship of the Frog is our wine club. So how do we choose a fellowship selection? It's, yeah. It is. <laughs> what, well, we get we get all the names on a dartboard and we no just no 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 that is oh, not, not true. Okay, sure. I forgot. <laughs> so the selections we make for the fellowship, which are these single block, these single uh, you know sing, single vineyard both expressions, wines, right? yeah. In this yeah. case, uh, both single block wines. Uh, they're not just done, but because we. Uh, you know, we, hey, we need a hey, we need a wine club or wine club or anything like that. For us, and I think these are two great examples of every year. There's some combination of site and soil and variety and rootstock and just patterns of, of brilliant decision making by the vineyard team. I, I, I would add to this. Yeah, you got to have yeah, that. Yeah, probably yeah. got to have that in there. Um, oh, please. That allows <laughs> a, a few wines to really rise to the top and really find the, the barrel we keep go tasting time yeah, after keep, time. Yeah, keep after going that. back to. And I think, you know, the, the Merlot 110R and the Office Block in 2015 are both drought vintages. They're both on 110R rootstock, which is a drought resistant rootstock um, that does exceptionally well in these low rainfall years. Um, we have a mix of 110R and St. George, which is another drought resistant uh, rootstock, really a deep rooting rootstock that both respond well to exploring the soil and, and are, that's underneath them, really driving their roots deep down into the soil. You know, to what end? Well, because we're training these vines as they go along to go find the water and go find the nitrogen that's being spread out through all these different cover crop. You know, this is the, the interaction of the root in these cases, I think is especially just, you know, serendipitous in a way where you have 
this this perfect kind of match for this. This year. is where it all comes together. I mean, your soil, your rootstock, your sign wood, your site, your year, the amount of rainfall, everything comes together for this magic moment. That's a magic moment, right? And, there. and I know, you know, sometimes we send these out. It's hey, one ten R block and you know office block. It's like you know, it's easy to point. We need sexier names. You know, we do need sexier names for our blocks. You know, one ten R. But it's you know, we're hoping we get to express a little bit of what you're actually tasting in these wines, which, you know, the, the Merlot 110 Ardetta, I think it's got that beautiful soft red fruit. It's got the, you know, kind of the plumminess that yeah, we love in really Merlot. Gorgeous, yeah. the, the 15, the office yeah. block, it's got that density. Six years of age. Nice. Got yeah. that density and got that power that we usually get out of office block that we always love. But really what you're tasting is, is kind of moving beyond the tasting note in a little bit, where I, I, you know, kind of want to move beyond the red fruit, black fruit, and stuff like that, where you're, what you're tasting in this Merlot and what you're tasting in the 15 office block, and really what you're tasting in any frog sleep wine, is that interaction between the soil and the root and the variety up top. And the sum total of those actions and all the decisions that went into planting that particular root, which we cannot take out of the ground. It's not, we can't just go out there and switch the roots this year. No. No, that's, yeah. that's hard to do. That's a longer term yeah. process. Yeah, that's yeah. a longer <laughs> process. That it's that pattern of decision making. It's that, uh, you know, that the sum total of all those actions for this block, which is planted in 2004, you know, it's 15 years of actions uh, going into making these wines. And it's just extremely exciting to, uh, to, uh, to taste how these decisions affected the wine in the end. And really what you're tasting in a way is 110R rootstock and how it interacted with that soil that year. And that's, you know, that it, it's kind of cool because we get asked like, okay, what's the organic part of, you know, what, can you smell organic wine, uh, which ideally you can't, because I think that's usually, uh, uh, you want, what, you're, what you're really tasting is <clears throat> Yeah, that ideal match between... You know, we get it all the time. People come and visit the winery and they say, there's something different about this winery. It feels alive, right? You can feel the energy, the living energy here. And that's really what we're trying to achieve in our wines too. People talk about natural wines and so on. It's this idea that the wines are alive and transparent of the soil. I thought it was all the oxygen we pumped into the air. No, and it's not. Them. No, it's not like that. casinos do? Oh. <laughs> It, it, it really is this idea that we've invited life back into our farming system. Very, very critical. You know, we don't have too much time left, but I want to cover a subject, a subject that's very dear to me, and that's the idea that this is bigger than us in a way. And how does this way of farming relate to the kind of wines that we want to make? We talk all the time at Frog's Leap about balance, restraint, and respect for the natural expression of the vine, letting this little fellow's personality come through in the wine that we're tasting. And I think that that is the soul and the unbelievable uh, heart of what we're talking ab about here. And to illustrate this point, we're gonna do a little thinking like a vine lecture. So I need all of you out there, put your glass down and stand up and I want you to stretch your arms out just like this fellow right here and put your branches out Thank you. Right? And ask a really fundamental question. Put your arms down, you look silly. No, no, uh, sorry. <laughs> what's this grapevine thinking about out in the vineyard? How to get 96 points from Robert Parker? How to get 83 points from the I'll stop it. <laughs> you, know? you know? How to how to make how to make uh, wine for how to how to make me wealthy? Apparently not, right? No. It is out here with the sole purpose of making uh, making wine to have I lost my microphone? It's working. Just make sure you talk. When you turn like this, we can't hear you. Oh, Natalie's telling me that you guys can't hear me well enough. I need to talk. We don't want to talk to you. <laughs> well, I, I get excited about this part because this is thinking like a grapevine. A grapevine's purpose out here isn't to make wine. It is to is to grow and to produce fruit so that it can spread its seed to propagate for another year. And this is the life of a grapevine, and it makes these incredibly important decisions. Like right now, it's just this bud right here just made the decision. It's time to come out for the spring. Could you imagine how important that decision is? If it comes out too early, it'll get killed by the frost. If it had come out even a couple weeks ago, it would have gotten it would frosted. Have, it would have had some problems, yeah. Right? But if it waits too long, the other vines are already starting to grow bigger than it, and it will start to lose its sunlight. So this is a really important decision. It has to make these decisions. How many buds do I set for the next year? 
How do I, when do I start to turn my berry purple? How many clusters do I set? Dad, why do I turn my berry purple? By the why way? does a grapevine even turn its berry purple? To make red wine? No, obviously. It's to attract birds. It's very fundamental to what it is. And so all these are very important decisions that the grapevine has to make. But how does it make those decisions? Well, it's out here and it's measuring the angle of the sun and the phase of the moon and the tug of the planets and the temperature in the soil and the moisture content in the soil, the kind of pheromones the fungi in the soil are giving out and, 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 and the moon phase and the movement of the planets and, and, and when the birds come through the vineyard and the insects and what life stage, everything is an important clue in this vine's life. And what we try to do is, look what happens in, in, in regular farming they tuck them all up and like this and they cut off their head and they poison the soil with herbicides and they get rid of the microorganisms in the soil and, and, they, and they essentially take the information out of the farming system and that's, that's what we try to do is to put that information back into the farming system through this way of farming and that's fundamental to what we're talking about with organic farming. And this touches on a subject called biodynamic farming, the idea that the farm is an organism that has all these other inputs. This is a subject that goes way beyond what we're talking about today and might be a subject for a, a further exploration. We have a more nuanced view when it comes to talking about uh, uh, biodynamics, and we'll get to that in general. We don't, we don't ascribe to all the theories that come with biodynamics, but that's a good uh, subject for another conversation. I, I think that the, you know, when we talk about when What's often talked about with biodynamics is the, the kind of familiar practices of stuffing stuff into a cow horn and uh, you know the homeopathic, the homeopathic kind of elements of that uh, is specifically the part of biodynamics that we're not big fan or not big we don't practice and we're not big fans of. However, I think it's important we've we've read the lectures about biodynamics we understand a lot of the principles behind that and I think that they drive naturally with what we are and what we are already doing out here which is. You know, when I, when I read Steiner's lectures for the first time, Rudolf Steiner, the kind of progenitor really of, of biodynamic farming, there were a couple of themes in there that really hit home with me, which is you have to recognize that we are, agriculture is a kind of imposition. This, you know, what we are doing out here is taking fruit off of these vines. We're trying to, uh, you know, this is not necessarily a fully natural system. So our job is, uh, as farmers is to basically take what do what we can do to build in and return back to the soil and return all of these uh, you know return the energy that we're taking out of the soil and putting it back into the soil and I think that that's a part of biodynamics that we're absolutely absolutely on and I think that 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 resonated with me early on I think that in a different form that resonated with you early on when it gets to the kind of uh, astrological interpretations essentially of uh, it's the cosmic it's the cut literally the cosmic rays coming through and channeling through cow horns and that's what's energizing the the, the, for, the uh, forces in the soil I could take it or leave it to be quite honest and uh, there might be something there but we have not figured out how to apply it into a farming system that makes sense for us essentially yeah so yeah, stay tuned on that there you know but all these things are with, uh, are all part of this process of, of uh, yeah, a little more wine here, of making wines that we believe reflect place, reflect perfect natural balance, and then have that beautiful restraint of nature. And the end result is a glass of wine like this. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah, not too bad. Yeah. So hopefully we have a few more questions, but if not, you know, we I think that's a. The biodynamic question is one that we get all the time. Um, I think in a way that we kind of consider ourselves to be a little bit beyond biodynamic in that, in that sense where we're, um, you know, we're looking beyond the kind of, you know, we don't, when we, when we think about organic farming, we're not necessarily thinking about- Well, we're beyond the, organic too. Yeah, in yeah. a way, yeah, we're, we're not thinking about so much, hey, what, you know, what are we gonna spray this year? What are we gonna apply this year? Uh, you know, you know what, what kind of new products have they approved for this and, uh, you know, in, in biodynamics, you know, how, boy, when am I going to make my prep 501 and, and that kind of stuff? It's more about, hey, what are the vines doing? And what are, you know, how are they reacting this year? When is the rain falling this year? Um, how, how did the vines grow last year? Does that give us any kind of information about how they're going to grow next year? It's, uh, I think that that's really where this is, uh, 
where this is going. So I got a question for you, Roy. You know, we're so proud of the way we farm, of that we've been certified organic for over 30 years. And yet, if you read our wine label, it wouldn't say anything about being farmed organically on it. How would you, how would you answer that question? And I'll see if I can too. <laughs> you know, I think it's more about, uh, uh, sorry, trying to get the, the mic figured out here. Yes. Um, what, people want to hear you? If people want to hear, <laughs> apparently, yeah. Um, so, I think that it's, it's important that, you know, we've talked about some concepts here with organic today that, um, that aren't, aren't something you find on a website. And they're not something that you necessarily uh, go into thinking about organic with. You, nobody really walks into a store shelf and, and has this fully formed idea of what organics is. And I think for us, it's, it's always been, we've been big believers in organic for a long time. Um, we, we fully believe in the, the value of this farming system to our wine quality, to the soil health, to the health of our employees, um, to, to everything everything that we do around here. I think that, I mean, I was, uh, when you converted to organics, I was four or five years old. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of in the abstract say, oh yeah, it's good, just spray whatever. Um, it's another thing when uh, I've got my young daughter now, uh, I, I would feel pretty bad about coming back with uh, poisons on my hands and things like that and coming yeah. and holding her. That's um, that kind of nuanced understanding of how organic uh, has come to, you know, what it's come to mean to us, I think is uh, something that is lacking or has been lacking from the overall kind of conception of organics. And so oftentimes when you put a label on something, if you just say, hey, this wine's organic, people are coming in with all of their, uh, their preconceptions. Pre preconceptions about what that is. You know, I think it's fortunate that that's starting to change a little bit. Uh, and, you know, things are, are changing in the marketplace and people are starting to understand a little bit better about how this goes. So stay tuned in terms of seeing organic.